Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, MSU Extension, the MSU Ag Experiment Station of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Welcome everyone to another episode of Montana Ag Live, coming to you live from the KS KUSM studios on the campus of Montana State University. My name is Tim Seipel, I'm your host tonight, and we have a great panel organized um, to talk about horticulture, to talk about organic agriculture, to talk about all our spring gardening needs. Um, tonight our special guest, I'll introduce the panel, we'll go from left to right over here. We have Perry Miller, he's our cropping systems professor. Next to him, our special guest, John Wicks from Tiber Organics. He's going to tell us all about his organic operation up near Ledger and all his crop health and crop diversity. We have Mac Burgess tonight to answer all your very, very challenging and difficult horticultural questions, <laughs> about especially in vegetable gardening. Gardening, And we have Abby Saeed, our horticulture specialist, and she's going to tell us all about um, all the different issues we're going to face this spring when we get to it. So you guys know how it works. Call in with your live questions. Get us some questions to the panel. And I'm going to come back to you, John. Tell us about um, Tiber or Ridge Organics and your organic operation. Yes, yeah, so um, I started out farming uh, after my dad passed away and kind of did things the way he had been doing it for about 10 years and got interested in some organic agriculture and took out some CRP and just dove kind of right in without really knowing very much and learned quite a bit, but ended up kind of falling in love with that kind of agriculture and farming that way and decided to convert the whole farm to organic and uh, try different experiments every year and really love growing cover crops. So. So you got interested in organic agriculture, why? And then I want to hear about yep. the CRP story, how that worked. Yeah, that was a challenge. Um, yeah, I guess we were just kind of struggling as a small family farm and, you know, it was hard to pay the bills. And so we were looking at different like niche markets to try and get ahead or get even. And so we looked into the organic and I just kind of was having a little more fun and then seeing, you know, the return on those acres and the mitigating that risk a little bit was just really appealing and just fun learning all these different things mm -hmm. about soil health. And the CRP was a little challenging to uh, get into that. Um, I think it was actually easier to transition already yeah. in production ground. I struggled with alfalfa, breaking that up and the grass and you know, there's still patches out there where it's alfalfa pretty thick. So, so that's a challenge and really dry. And I don't know if we had the best cover or CRP mix you know, back when we put it in. It was in CRP for about 20 years, so. Okay. Long time. All right. Thanks. We're gonna come back and ask you some more questions. I was remiss, I forgot to introduce our phone operators tonight. We have Cheryl Bennett and Candace Lamori who are answering our phones tonight. So please be sure to call in and keep them both busy on the phone lines. Okay. So, well, we have a question that did come in and it's actually about Kernza, and this was a little bit related to last week's episode where we talked about malt barley. So here at MSU, Jamie Sherman, who was on last week, has been working on Kernza beer brewing, and this caller wanted to know, what is Kernza, and can it be grown in Montana? I'll let you handle that Okay, one, so Kernza is, it's a, the type of perennial wheat, and it's a hybrid between, well, it's got some genetic cross between intermediate wheatgrass and, and conventional wheat. Um, and there's different, there's different ways to arrive at this perennial wheat. The, the, the Kernza type was actually arrived at by starting with the perennial grass, intermediate wheat, and trying to introgress. Uh, wheat genes into that to get larger seeds. So it's it's essentially grass seed, but it's 
you know, you want larger uh, seeds that start to look a little bit like wheat. Uh, so yeah, it can be grown. Um, we are growing some at our at our research farm here in Bozeman, uh, getting some experience with it. It was a little more challenging to establish than uh, than I've you know I've grown lots of different crops and lots of different perennials, and this one for whatever reason was more challenging than 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 others. So, uh, but we'll see how. I, so I'm excited to see how it stools this year, and if, you know what kind of heads and what kind of seed production we get. So yeah, if we could really get it to yield, it would be an amazing breakthrough because all our crops that we eat now. Corn, rice, wheat, all of them are annual crops and it requires all this disturbance, replanting every year. So when if we get there, could make it in the future. Sounds good, right? Yep. But it, it's still at its heart is kind of like grass seed production. And so with grass seed production, you usually have one or two really good seed years and then it's grass after that. So it's going to have to be some hybrid forage uh, slash grain uh, <coughs> market for some time, I think. I mean, there's a, a fundamental physiological limitation there. A plant only makes so much sugar and it either chooses to put it in its roots and survive or make seed with it. And you kind of can't do a lot of both, yeah. right? So, so yeah. how many years do you usually get out of one seeding of the Kernza? So that's a good question because it, um, it, it can actually live a long time, especially it, if our plots are an example, it's not a very uniform plant type. Like we've got everything that looks like grass to actual plants that look like they had little wheat seeds on them. And so I don't know how uniform it is. It's like more like a population. But I think that grass is going to be there for a long time. Um, I'm, but, but so that grain harvest phase, I don't quite know how that's going to go. But if it, if it, I used to be in grass seed production. And so it, we usually hope to get, you know, two good seed production years. And after that, it gets so sod bound that it, it just doesn't want to throw heads. Then there's different ways of trying to stimulate that head development. But uh, so it, yeah, I, I, so I guess the answer is I really don't know. I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, is, deduce is, from what I know. Relative. Is some kind of physical disturbance like light tillage sort of one of those that, means? That, yeah, or, yeah, stand renovation can, can do yeah. that. Uh, I, wonder if, I wonder if that diversity in form is a, an advantage in, in some sense in the long uh, term. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Survival or... Yeah. Yeah. John, tell That's us nice. about your rotations on, on your farm. What crops do you grow and what kind of rotations do you have across your different fields? So I grow a lot of lentils. Um, every couple of years I do some chickpeas, um, barley, spring wheat, durum. Um, I've tried, I'm not much of an oilseed farmer. I've tried flax and mustard, but never really have a good year. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of the rotation, then I'll do like an eight to 12 way cover crop mix in like a fallow year. And usually that I'm doing about a quarter of the acres in that. And I really just kind of really keep an eye out when I'm out working and see like, all right, here's an issue I'm seeing in the field. Like a cover crop would help with this or this crop might help it kind of control. So it's not a set rotation like a lot of people get into a five or seven year set rotation, which I think is really a good thing management wise. But I've been kind of jumping all over while staying in the same, you know, plant back restrictions with lentils and things and then planning out the next year's crops. What will kind of be a good rotation there? So it jumps around a lot, but it's kind of a management nightmare to kind of pick. But in some chaos, it works out. Yeah. So on the screen right now, we have a picture of an earthworm on there. So do you want to tell us about how, well, what the earthworm's doing here and then maybe about how you're thinking about managing your soil health? Yeah, so this was a cover crop mix that was like a, it was a really diverse mix and it did really well. And like, I, I had never seen an earthworm on the farm and I was kind of digging around to see the organic matter that had broke down and I found earthworms all over the place and it was just really interesting to see. So I kind of thought I was on the right uh, path. And then that crop, that one we, I think in one year we about raised that organic matter percentage just under 1%. And we didn't graze it or anything like we usually do and we left the left everything stand and then worked it in with a disc. And this is the mix uh, kind of in the end in the fall when it was kind of breaking down. And the reason we didn't graze this one was there was no fences or water available. So I just kind of thought, well, we'll see what happens. And it really helped with the water holding capacity and just the pores in the soil. Um, so it was really fun to see that happen. And so now I try and graze off a little less maybe than I usually did. We try and hit about 30% left standing, but 
it, you know, sometimes you go a little over that, and especially if the cows need feed. So I think I see some warm season crops in that cover crop mix. When would you? When's the latest you'd seed something like that? Um, I've seeded middle of June, and even I think I seeded one. One of the first years was the weekend before the Fourth of July, and we just got a really timely rain, and it mm -hmm. did really well. But like the 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 millet and the red clover and well mainly the red clover like that won't germinate for a while so a lot of times i think that gets choked out but i like to have them in like first week of june if not before yep. so you're up by tiber which is tiber reservoir and when i go across the state i ask people a lot about what cover crops they're using and maybe what forage crops that they have in there and you actually see big differences in the cooler high southwest valleys you don't see very little c4 grass and Perry has failed a number of times at growing C4 grasses in the cooler areas of Montana. Um, so what do you use? Um, I really look at you know some of my soil tests and see what my carbon to nitrogen ratios are and what maybe some of the needs are. And then using a smart mix calculator online and kind of building up a mix that'll work. But I really like sorghum stand grass, sunflowers, red clover, turnip, radish and you know grazing corn i've thrown pumpkins in the mix before and try weird things um and it's just it's really fun to watch which ones are going to grow and which ones don't uh, you're not exactly in a high rainfall area no i think right. yeah 11 inches of rain a year it's about as dry are, are you dry land yeah this is all dry land yeah all dry yeah. land yeah mm -hmm. so you can you really depend on the rain the last four years we've been in kind of a drought and the cover crops really didn't even germinate until the fall when we got a rain at harvest. So it was kind of a wasted uh, wasted seed there, but you gotta try for it, I guess. You mentioned chickpeas as one of your crops. I'd like to hear something about that before the evening's out because that's a tough one to do organically, so. Yeah, they're really tricky. Um, I've put flax with them that help with the acicida um, and then just some heavier seed rates, but I don't think I go quite as heavy as some of the conventional guys might be doing. I go about 120 pounds an acre, and they seem to do all right. They do a little bit better with that flax um, as helping it compete. But you know, the harvesting is the main issue. They get, you know, they're wet. I've harvested them after snow, oh so boy. we try and okay. swath them down and go through. But I'm kind of tempted to use that stripper header if they're tall enough, because <laughs> but that's mm -hmm. pretty short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. All right, so we have a question, um, Abby, and this is a follow-up about cardboard for moths. So we talked last week in the show a little bit about using cardboard around our fruit trees to catch the coddling moths mm -hmm. as they go up. And this caller was wondering what side of the tree or where on the tree that cardboard should be placed. Yeah, so the best spot, so what you're doing with, these, uh, with this cardboard, um, and when you do it, it's about late May, kind of um, the end of May, that's when they're traveling up. Um, to find a spot to kind of pupate. And so what you're trying to mimic, because they'll find cracks and crevices inside um, the, the trunk of the tree to, to nest, you want the corrugated part on the inside, and they're gonna kind of find a spot in there in those kind of ridges, and they're gonna hunker down on there. And so putting two bands of that, um, especially if you have larger trees that are harder to, to kind of manage with uh, insecticide applications, this can be a way that you can really reduce your populations over time. And then you can do another one later in the summer, another set of cardboard um, to, to catch a, the next set. So the idea is this is a trap. And yeah, just a trap. Take just, yeah, reducing the population. When would you put it on? And when would Usually you at the end of May, and then whenever you kind of see the movement, when it fills up, you can replace that and swap it off again in July or so. Because coddling moths become a pest on apples when the fruit is formed, and they're yes. going to crawl up on there and Absolutely. <laughs> eat their way in. And yes, and eggs. no one likes to see those oh, kind worm. of, yeah, wormy <laughs> apples. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Hope we get some good apples this year in the Gallatin Valley. So th this, the whole panel can maybe put their input on. So we have a caller from Shepherd who is wondering if commercial fertilizer is better than natural fertilizer, i.e. cow or sheep manure. And if so, what kind of commercial fertilizer or type of manure should we be putting on our gardens? That's a big question. That's that is a big question. Uh, commercial fertilizers, generally speaking, are immediately available yep. and inexpensive. and They may be more uniform in their nutrient Very, very uniform, yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah. You know, and nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all the micronutrients, they've all got a complex story. We could have an entire semester long class about mm -hmm. this. Um, so when we think about that, so for example, you know, some manures might have more potassium, more phosphorus, and have less nitrogen in them. Or yeah. compost out of our garden tends to have way more potassium, way more phosphorus, but not have so much nitrogen. Right. If I wanted to supplement my nitrogen a little bit, because that's my biggest nutrient limitation in my home garden, is chicken manure, horse manure, cow manure, is there one that provides more nitrogen in these contexts? I think know? they're all pretty balanced nitrogen versus phosphorus ratios. So that's okay. the challenge is, is getting enough nitrogen on without overloading the phosphorus yeah. with a manure source. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to have them co you know, a compost of manure if you want to mm -hmm. get some timely nutrient rele release. Otherwise, it's got to do all that bit on you know while it's sitting on your land. So. Yeah, and, but then you also have to be very careful from where your manure comes from. You just can't take any horse manure or cow manure because they may have eaten forage that was treated with certain herbicides which then passes through comes out into the manure and causes major herbicide injury and in, that's in the absolutely a concern I, I would be yeah. extremely hesitant to to use any locally sourced manure unless you really know where it's coming from yeah. and where mm -hmm. all the One feed for those animals is coming from and yeah. You trust that person that they know what they're doing. Yeah. And if you're not sure, you can do a little bioassay too. You can use some peas or something like that and plant it and see if it shows those symptoms of herbicide injury. So if you're not sure where it's coming from and you kind of want to see, that could be a way to... You know, as far as products you might buy in a garden center that come in a bag, if there's any appreciable nutrient content, they oftentimes will have a number just like a fertilizer bag. So I, I think of the a common chicken manure product that's available that's 3 2 2, 3% yep. nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, 2% potassium. You know, and, and fertilizers come in various blends too. So if you want to get particular about it, you should do a soil test and respond with the particular nutrients. And it would be easier to go wrong being haphazard with chemical fertilizers, for sure. You could apply way too much really easily. Yep. Burn things. Right. Uh, I think generally speaking in moderate doses, manure or composted manure, other than the herbicide issue is you could add this much or this much and you're not going to, you might waste a little bit of money, but you're not going to hurt anything probably. Yep. But nitrogen is often the limiting factor. Yep. Yeah. That's what I've looked at uh, spreading manure from a feedlot and then chicken litter. Mm -hmm. And that's been my hesitation is just what is that animal eating that's going to be left um, behind. So I've been taking my time on it, but... Uh, well, at your scale, how many truckloads would you need? Right? And I've found some local places, but the trucking is definitely the, the... And how many tons per acre that need to go on is really... You know, you'd have to pick, right, this field this year and move throughout, and it's kind of a... But, John, you were saying you were using some compost teas. Describe that. What? Did, tell us what a compost tea is and how you kind of go about putting this down. So th the stuff that I'm using is a compost that is sifted that comes from South Dakota uh, Soil Works LLC. And basically, instead of spreading all that large tonnage out over every acre, we're extracting the biology using a uh, extractor. And basically, we're pumping oxygen in to extract the biology from the compost and then getting a really concentrated um, extract out of it and that is going down right in the drill per in the furrow and this is a picture of that extractor that I have and it just bubbles for about 20 minutes and it'll bring water in and out at the same rate so you just kind of punch in you know how you're going to do it and then you put the pounds in and then I fill that blue tank in the back and go out and it's a little more shelf stable, I guess, than a tea. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a little bit of time to go. You probably have two days to get it on. Um, but if it sits in your tank, you have to bubble it because it still has some mm -hmm. silt. And it can kind of cause, you know, little tubes to plug. But uh, it's, it's a really efficient way to do it. Um, this year we're mixing, I'm doing humic and compost together. Um, a producer up by me, Corey Hawks, uh, said it's a little easier to get it out on the ground. So he kind of told me the ratio he's using, and so we're going to try and put it down right through the air system on the drill. Yeah. And so I think that'll be a little less labor intensive and less things to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Good. Perry, or anyone, humic acid. I hear a lot about humic acid, but I don't really know how it fits into our, how we understand soil and soil biology. 
Soil biology is a complicated thing. Soil organic matter is a complicated thing. Humic acid is, is supposed to be a particular fraction of, of soil organic matter. Um, I'm not a soil expert, right? This is where we need Clay Jones or somebody on, on the show. Well, Mac, you, you teach some of this stuff. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, yeah. It, it's complicated humic stuff. Humic acid yeah. isn't just one thing. There's a, yeah. a whole bunch of different ones, and um, they're fairly stable. Mm -hmm. um, and the soil carbon world is actually learning that you know the way you get humic acid is not maybe as representative as, as a, but for its function in the soil. Right. So there's, there's a lot of exploration going on right now relative to soil carbon, soil organic matter, soil biology, various biological yeah. additives. So. Probably an important component of, you know, to use a colloquial term, kind of the glue that holds soil structure together. Um, not actively participating rapidly in nutrient cycling, but, but you know, maybe, maybe creating structure and habitat for other organisms to do that. Helping to build the sponge, right? Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay, so we have a, some call, we have some questions that have come in for you, Abby. We have an anaconda caller who would like to know how much water should they put on their lawn? Should it be watered all at once, once a week, or spread out through the week? Awesome, great question. So lawns traditionally, most of our common cool season grasses for turf grass lawns, usually around this time of year in the spring and the fall, usually require about one to one and a half inches of water per week. And the best way to water your lawn in terms of kind of the spread is to have deep but infrequent watering. So you want to do it maybe twice a week, not more than that, because when you do that, you're encouraging that moisture to go down deeper into the soil, and that encourages the root system of the turf grass to go down deeper. It makes it more resilient to drought and things like that. So in springtime, you're aiming for one to one and a half inches, and that's including precipitation, so keep track of the precipitation. Um, and then in those hot summer months, that's when you might need to up it to about two inches, but one inch around now, once or twice a week usually. So I don't know about anaconda, but I've been reading in the newspaper in Bozeman, you know, about our closed basin and our looming water shortage and, and potential watering restrictions on grass. How is that going to factor into this? It, it can. So that is a good point. Um, a lot of our, our turf grasses that we use in lawns, some of them are more kind of water intensive than others. And Kentucky bluegrass is an example of that. It needs almost double the amount of water as some of these other turf grasses and fine fescues like creeping red fescue and chewing spots rescues require less than that. So if people are concerned about that, I'm thinking like if, if people want to transition their lawn over to something that's going to require less water, that's an important consideration. Other things to do would be reducing your overall area of lawn that you have, um, but that can be a major consideration because there is you know, we are going to be restricted in water in general. We're um, not able to keep up with just the population and being able to meet those water needs. So we need to think creatively in terms of landscaping that doesn't require very much additional irrigation. I'm going to fess up to being a terrible steward of my lawn, but... Me too. Um, <laughs> me too. I, I don't usually water it. <laughs> yeah, me neither. And, and it's, it looks presentable. Mm -hmm. I mow it. Um, I have fertilized it, mm -hmm. not three times a year, but it, it usually doesn't seem to me, in, here in Bozeman, a cooler climate, and we have mm -hmm. fairly heavy soils, you know, usually well into June, if not mm -hmm. July, before it starts to slow down, and I'm wel I welcome not mowing. Exactly. <laughs> for a while. Mm -hmm. And then it... And, and then it turns brown and it doesn't die. No. It's just, yeah. you know, and then it comes back in the fall. Yep. It doesn't require water yeah. unless you want it to be green and exactly. keep mowing, right? Yeah. And then, you, you know, you, you, if you want it to be healthy, you should probably fertilize it too. And, oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Taking care of your lawns. It's a lot of work. Lawns. Lawns lawns a lot of work. work. Keep the lawnmowers busy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> John, we have a question that came in. Um, and they were wondering about. What do you, do you do regenerative agriculture? What do you think of regenerative agriculture? And are you involved in these regenerative agriculture markets that are out there? Yes, yeah, so I do, I think, you know, regenerative agriculture is anything that is making, focusing on soil health and practices that are uh, building soil health. Um, I do have a regenerative organic certification that I have had for two years now. 
And the only contract I've had with it is for Patagonia Provisions. We're doing a pasta line this year. So I'm going to be growing some Durham from them. And it's usually a, a couple percent on top of an organic price is kind of what their the premium should be for that. Um, I have mixed feelings about it, you know, not being a USDA label. And I'm, you know, I think that that is maybe the customer doesn't trust in that label as much. Are there so. particular practices that they require of you to earn that? Yeah, the one that I have has like animal welfare is a big one, uh, employee well-being, and then, you know, minimal, minimal tillage. So I usually, I do one pre-pass tillage with a Kelly Diamond, uh, they call it a Harrow, but it's more of a disc. But so I think we have a video of that, but um, so it's just really low disturbance, low tillage. And there's, you know, yeah, here's that it goes. It's quite an interesting piece of equipment. And in dry, uh, it'll, it'll actually pull weeds out if it's too dry to get the discs into the ground. But, and really low maintenance machine and really a, a time effective piece of equipment. But so that's one of the lower like things you have to do is low tillage um, and cover cropping. And there's there's quite a few things that they want you to check off. But so it's kind of fun and it was neat learning all that. But I don't know if I'd, I'd like there to be a USDA label for something like that or just, you know, help bring organic more focused on these regenerative practices. And maybe you, you and Perry, you guys could speak to that. So or the USD organic label is defined by a set of practices inspections that go, how does that differ from these regenerative certifications that we have out there? So re regenerative still requires a certification of some sort. So you're still dealing with an inspector, but the flexibility seems quite significant with regenerative ag compared to organic. It's not such a rigid set of rules that you operate with. And it does consider your particular context in your farm, you know, you know, particular management challenges that you might have on your particular farm. Those, you know, you're, you're allowed to address those in ways that you might not be allowed to in an organic. But, but yours is more complicated because you're dealing with both, right? This, you're, this is over top of the organic certification. Yep. So to even to get considered for this, you have to have the USDA organic certification, mm -hmm. and then that's kind of where it all starts. Um, and it's different. There's no real time. You know, you don't have to be doing it for the 36 months like you would uh, right. on the organic. So I think they're still kind of learning what they want. But the reason I chose, there's other certifiers out there that will certify convention ground as regenerative too. So it's kind of interesting to watch all these things kind of kind of shape up and see yeah, where they're going to go. It's separate streams. And some of the, the farmers I've talked about on the or talked with on the conventional side, they don't really seem that excited about the premiums so so yep. much as learning more about their system and how to be more self-reliant with, with their own soil and, and to reduce costs and, and, and be more profitable that way. And that's the, you know, the interesting thing, I think, is that, you know, organic producers and these practices can be used on either you know, operation, and they save you a lot of money. And you know, once you start learning the benefits of all these things and what they're actually doing, it's you know, they're, they're a lot more beneficial than just like choking out weeds. You know. Okay, Mac, I got a question for you. Uh -oh. The caller from Fort Benton is wondering if using ducks or even a fox, I don't know what, it can be an alternative to control snails and grasshoppers. I think ducks would probably eat snails and grasshoppers. Yep. Ducks might also eat your baby cabbage plants. I've heard of people who can, I'm assuming this is a garden. Uh, yeah, uh, I probably. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of, of folks deploying ducks um, intentionally for insect management. In Asian rice they do, yeah. but it's in rice patties. Right where the ducks can eat some of the insects, but probably the ducks don't eat as much of your garden. And, or yeah, your chickens, in my experience, when the chickens have gotten into the garden, it has not gone well yep. with regards to the vegetables, or the tomatoes anyways. Chickens like tomatoes. Yep. Okay, we have a follow-up question. Caller from Brady was wondering if you work manure into the soil, lay it on the soil, or leave it on top. They're concerned that there will be soil loss if they turn it under. What should they do? And I'm not, they're calling from Brady, so uh, they could be dry land wheat, they could be an irrigated. Um, we don't really have much in there, but John, if what do you do with manure or inorganic situations? What do, do we try to work manure in? Do we? 
I would. If I was planning to do it, I would uh, top dress it and then I would work it in um, just to help speed up uh, how everything would break down. Um, but you could leave it on top and let it break down slowly. Just might take a little more time. I think you'd lose at least half your nitrogen if you don't yeah. work it in. So if you yeah. didn't work it in, basically that nitrogen that's in there becomes goes out into the atmosphere, blows away. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. what? You're in a pretty windy place too. Yeah. Won't the manure itself blow away if it's not? <laughs> <laughs> it might. Yeah. And mind you, that would be true of, of urea as well too, right? Yeah. Any any fertilizer source where most of the nitrogen is in ammonium form, especially on our higher pH soils, if it's on the surface um, and doesn't get a lot of water all at once, it's mm -hmm. it's likely to volatilize and blow away and, and come down on somebody else's farm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we even have to watch when we do some, tillage with that wind. To, some oh, days yeah. you just can't get anything done because all your topsoil would be gone. So yeah, yeah. Okay, Abby, maybe a, a question from you. A caller from Anaconda has a female dog that urinates on the lawn, and it probably leaves dead spots or highly fertilized spots in the lawn at least sometimes. What can they do to keep the grass alive? That's a really tough question. I mean, there are a few strategies just because just the, the high nitrogen content of the urine um, can turn those grassy patches into like the yellowish brown sections. Mm -hmm. But a few strategies to reduce that could be to make sure that your dog, like if you have sections of your landscape, to make sure that she's not going to the same spot over and over again. But other than diluting, so once they urinate, watering your lawn and diluting that can help kind of reduce reduce how much um, you know browning occurs of your lawn but there aren't too many great strategies outside of because there it's going to keep happening as they're going to keep urinating on the lawn and so those dead spots are occurring because basically there's the night it's you're burning it's them. burning it yeah. all, if it's burning the roots it's yeah. burning everything from, yeah. with that high and, nitrogen yeah and diluting yeah. it with some water like if you see the spot you can just take a little hose out and just water it down it will reduce that potentially um, and, and kind of limit the amount, but that's a difficult, there isn't a, a nice solution for that. So the best, I have dogs, right? And so every spring I've got these brown patches from the, from the female dogs. Mm -hmm. The male, it doesn't seem to be an issue. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just a different pattern. Um, but how do, I re how do I reclaim those patches? It seems like by the end of the summer they're, they're green again, but it mm -hmm. takes a long time for those yeah. patches. And I mean, so is it really just about watering? I mean, yeah, just <laughs> diluting that because as long as that high, high nitrogen content is there, it's kind of burnt it and your yeah. grass will slowly recover and, and just spread into that and fill in those areas. You can encourage that by overseeding, but any kind of grass that is going to be exposed to that large concentration of urine is going to get brown. That'd be an interesting one to pull a soil core on and have it analyzed <laughs> yeah. and see what's there. But yeah. I imagine it's just yeah. high salinity from all you know, uh, yeah. everything, yeah. all the all the salts, right? Mm -hmm. But then I end up with these bright green circles all over the place by the end of the summer. Yes, right? yeah, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're filling in. The, yes. the Actually, if you look exactly. at our lawn right now, you can see we're probably nitrogen limited because it's really short. But then where the dog is urinated, <laughs> it's it's <laughs> quite a bit taller in spots. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, Abby, another caller. Caller had a lilac removed from the lawn. They are putting in a building in that area and are wondering if the leftover roots will continue to sucker and become a problem. I mean, it depends on how much of the lilac you removed. If you removed the good amount and you dug it out, lilac I haven't seen to be something that will really prolifically sucker around if you've removed the majority of it. Um, if you're putting a building in, like depending on the kind, I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about that if you've removed the majority of that root system. Yeah, I would think so. Lilacs don't, yeah, they're not they, as they're bad. They're not, not like aspens and things like yeah, that right. that are just going to pop up all over the place. Push the sidewalk up. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Don't seem to be And if stuff. you are interested in trees, this is a perfect opportunity. We have our Gardening in Montana Spring Workshop that's coming up in May 18th. And so we're going to have a focus on trees for our, um, this workshop. And so um, if, if you are interested in, we have a variety of cool topics, including, um, you know, container gardening um, and trees, tree issues, tree recommendations for Montana, beekeeping, planting design. So if you are interested, it's on May 18th. It's going to be at Museum of the Rockies. It's $20. That includes lunch, and the QR code should be scannable, or you can go to bit.ly slash um, 
Monte, I think the yeah MSU 2024 gardening. And um, if you can't get a hold of that, please send me an email and I'll send you a link. But we have that coming up in a couple of weeks. Great, thanks. Cool. It'll be it'll be great. I bet everyone will learn a lot. Okay, we had a follow up question for John and Perry. And you guys mentioned stripper headers. Caller wants to know, what is a stripper header? Do you use it in regenerative agriculture? And what kind of are the advantages of a stripper header? Yeah, I, uh, so a stripper header is kind of, uh, it's got all these blades with these fingers that rip the head of the wheat, kind of strips it off the stem, and it goes into the combine just the head. So you're really only thrashing the head of it. And so you're a lot, better on your machine, you're not burning as much fuel, and you're leaving uh, like a large amount of the stem there to catch snow, to shade the ground, and just provide cover. And you can, since you're not thrashing the whole stem, you can go a lot faster. And it's just, they, they have a lot of benefits in regenerative <coughs> agriculture, and they're really fun to use, and there's not much to them, so. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was actually surprised to hear that you were using them in organic agriculture because they're a big deal in no-till systems. I think this is actually going to be the next big game changer for, for no-till systems because it's changing on the microclimate of what's going on on the landscape in a very profound way by reducing evaporation, reducing wind speed, inc you know, increasing water use efficiency. I mean, so we've been doing a study at the post farm where we just, we're not quite a stripper header, but we harvest our wheat pretty tall, so we got tall versus short stubble. And we have, over the last six years, we've got 16 comparisons where we can grow, compare the yields in tall stubble versus short stubble. The yield has never been higher in short stubble. In five out of those 16 cases, it was higher in the tall stubble, presumably because of higher water use efficiency. And in those five years, it averaged 13% higher yield. Well, if it costs me less, that's a big to harvest yield. it, right? And I get more yield. I mean, this is this is like, yeah. hmm, why wouldn't I do that? There's a grower up by us that he has a YouTube channel and stuff, Corey Falk, and he did a little video where the wind was howling like 70 miles an hour, and yeah. he got down in the stubble, and you could hear him talking, and you couldn't yeah. hear the wind. And so it was, yeah, they're really great for erosion and things like that. that Does are, it make it hard to go back in and plant, right? You have this really tall stubble that's out there, and do you do you need different? Do you need a different kind of drill? Would, would a hoe drill work, or do you need a, the a way, real disc drill? That's a good question. Yeah, the way that I'm doing it right now, I have a disc drill, um, but you still get like some things caught up in the opener there. Um, but really, I'm doing that tillage pass with that disc before, so it's chopping everything pretty good, and then you don't have any problem. So it, I think if you were going to be in tillage or organic, a hoe drill would be fine, but you might have find yourself dragging some bunches of stock eventually, but the disc drill is pretty nice to cut through things. I think in no-till systems, that is the catch, right? Yep. You probably do need a disc drill, and so that's, that's you know, if you don't already have one, that's a pretty major purchase to go along with the stripper header. So you get all the wins, but you're going to change your seating yeah. method a little and, bit. And those disc drills are a lot of maintenance. That um, can be, can be. Yeah. yeah. Another thing about the stripper header is they're quite a bit heavier than a regular header, so you kind of, if anybody's thinking about buying one, they should be aware of the weight that their combine can handle. So mine's a, I think, 26 or 32 foot, and, you know, I've known guys that bought the big 36, 40 footers, and it's a lot for their combines, so. Yeah. Thanks. So we had a, a great question. So, uh, Abby, to you, we have a caller from, well, we have two callers. First, a question from Missoula is wondering if she can use soil that's been dug up by ground squirrels in her garden. Maybe Mac or Abby, you guys could answer that. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about the next question. I mean, if it was a, if it was like a perennial bed or something like that, I wouldn't worry too much. But if it was a veggie garden, I might be concerned about potential disease issues. But um, I would say I'm not too sure, depending on the context, if I would use it um, in any kind of garden where you're growing food. Yeah, I might just throw it in the compost pile and dig it out a couple of years later yeah. when it comes out. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. good to have had gophers, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Abby, a follow-up. Um, Florence Caller has wild roses that have taken over um, their lawn. They want to know if, if there is an easier way to control them or if they have to take the hard way and dig them out themselves. 
That's going to be hard. Um, I mean, you can use herbicides. Um, you can use, uh, you know, a broadleaf herbicide um, potentially to, to try and manage it. But for kind of woody plants, it's, it's difficult. You're going to need to remove that, the woody material physically anyways. Um, so I would say you might need to use a combination of those two strategies to, to get a hold of that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think digging all those wild rose roots out, that's a, that's a battle that's not going to be easily won or if it's even possible. Um, if you really want to get ra uh, rid of them, I, herbicide's probably the only way I'd really know how to get rid of them fully in that context. Mm -hmm. And there are some broadleaf herbicides that people use on their lawns mm -hmm. that would probably get yeah. the wild roses pretty pretty well. So a few years ago when I was in Big Sandy, uh, I came across a, somebody who had uh, this mutant type of wild rose that apparently came out of the Bear Palm Mountains. It has an orange blossom on it. You know, usually roses are pink or yellow, but this has, it's orange and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so I have that in my yard and for one week, Oh, it's fun to look at, <laughs> <laughs> but it is spreading everywhere. And so I'm constantly mowing, you know, chopping so, off stems. So does stems. consistent mowing not keep it? Yeah, well? it does. It yeah. slows it down pretty good. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I, you know, I think so. That's another. And you're a weeds person. Like having a healthy lawn yep. is mm -hmm. is or any crop is is you know job number one in, in weed competition. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mowing and yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe letting your lawn be in a little higher too, getting that grass really dense in there. Mm -hmm. But the, that, yeah, then when woods rose will it, always, yeah. Right. When I want to get rid of it, I dig it up and I give it to friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take some. Yeah. There you That's go, cool. yeah. All right. Um, we have a caller. I don't know if we can answer this. Maybe we'll refer him to Stephen Van Tassel. Caller from Ronan is wondering how to get rid of voles in their pasture land. I think that's I a think Stephen, that's a Van, Stephen Tassel. Van Tassel question. He's Montana Department of Agriculture, the vertebrate control specialist. Mm -hmm. You can find him on the internet, and if you can't find him, reach out to us, and we'll, yeah. we'll get you in contact with him. I was just talking to him last week. So we had a question that came in that's maybe a mix of garden and his crop, and that is, can we grow cow peas, black-eyed peas, or also sometimes called purple hull peas in Montana? Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> um, we, uh, so Zach Miller, actually, over at the Western Ag Research Center but over by Missoula, um, has been playing with, with various early maturing lines of cowpeas and actually gotten um, seed yield of several of them. And so we've got a research project underway. I've actually grown seed now twice at the, at, you know, here at the Post Farm, which is a pretty cold environment, right? So if I can do it here, you can do it probably just about anywhere in Montana. I thought we were just being so incredibly innovative with with this, you know, really drought-hardy, warm-season cowpea, and then I'm looking through the the crop statistics for Montana when they came out in February, and somebody in Sheridan County grew a whole quarter section of oh, wow. cowpeas last year, and so I actually, you know, how small Montana is, I was able to actually find out who the grower was and <laughs> called him up, and we had a good visit, and now he's growing uh, 400 acres this year because the first time it worked so well, and he made you know made some good money from it, so. So yeah, maybe it's more possible than, than I would have thought. Yeah. The, the word cow peas, you think you feed them to cows, but that's the same species as a black-eyed pea. Yeah, so his was black-eyed pea. Black -eyed so there's so many different bean types, mm -hmm. but right. it, specifically the black-eyed pea has so a pretty high-value true value. Pretty high value yeah. food yeah. product there. Yeah, yeah, it is a high-value food product. But that's a warm, but, warm so season. So cow bean. peas, black-eyed peas, and purple hull peas are not true beans to the genus Phaseolus, which is a bean from Central America. Cow peas, black-eyed peas, and those are actually an African legume that were originally domesticated in the Horn of Africa. They're not peas either. And they're not, not, peas, they're not either. peas either. <laughs> and they're not they're peas either. Not peas. Yeah, so we, we don't have great names for them. So, yeah, but was it, so is the growing time needed? Is it less than, say, a dry bean in Montana? You know, we produce some dry beans. Yeah, it's similar to dry beans, right? So very, very high heat requirements. Um, I, I don't think we even start to get any emergence until the soil's at least 60 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you worry about frost, right? Because it's it, the, the growing point's above ground. So we've been fortunate. We've had, we had a little bit of frost last spring and it burned them up pretty good. But the, uh, the two or three weeks later, they, grad, you know, they grew out of it and we've dodged some fall frost. And so yeah. Yeah, we'll see. We're gonna keep playing with it. And, yeah. 
I've every... grown them in a oh. uh, cover crop mix before. <laughs> okay. so, yeah, and uh, I had Joseph from Timeless Seeds, who oh, yeah. was originally from Kenya, and he was like, is that a cowpea in that cover crop mix? I'm like, yeah, and he got really excited. So um, so that was really fun. I imagine it's something that some breeding work would, would help with. I know the dry beans have a weird... Uh, interaction between photo period and uh, nighttime temperatures that can control their flowering and, and you know the days to flowering that are listed in variety descriptions are just all over the place in, in a place where it gets cold at night. One of the, one of the just what not to belabor cowbees here but one of the reasons <laughs> we're interested in them is they're pretty unique for producing an extra floral nectar yep. so uh, so yep. a nectar long before it flowers. And the it's, extra floral nectaries can the the parasitoid wasp that attacks the wheat stem saw fly needs those extra floral nectaries to live yeah. or, or to get more nutrition yeah. out of it. So Earlier, that could be one yeah. of the ban advantages. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have a couple questions. Perry, these are all coming to you. So first, we have a caller from Shelby who want, is wondering how to dig up and transplant wild roses. The <laughs> second one comes from Perry from Marlborough, Sydney, Australia. Uh -oh. Oh. And that one is after your orange rose, uh, after your orange roses bloom, what do you do with the rose hips and are they orange too? Uh, that's a great, I'll answer the last one first. It doesn't produce any rose hips and I don't mm. know why. So it just blooms and you know everything dries up and I yeah so it's not like a you know our conventional wild rose where you get that nice red berry yep. I don't get anything like that so that's a great question. Uh, so you, well you probably have a better answer for what time of year to you know usually mm -hmm. I I try to go later in the fall when things are cool and yeah 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 fall is one of the best times to transplant anything so yeah I would dig it up usually you know probably at the end of September or so um, and find a new spot to put it. But um, Could you, you do it this time of year? Could you you do can, it right yeah, now? you can yeah. definitely. Yeah. If the soil is yeah. workable right now, yeah. you definitely can also. Spring and fall are usually the most popular times to transplant, you know, perennials. So I used to grow tea roses and like they mm -hmm. would die all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not the best this, state this, for tea uh, roses. <laughs> no. this, uh, this, this wild rose, is, it's a hardy thing. Okay, so we had a Bozeman caller who is wondering if free mulch that the city of Bozeman provides is safe to use, not knowing if they had any sorts of disease issues or not. And if so, where should they use it? Garden trees, ETC. Yeah, so if you're getting mulch from any kind of arborist or tree company or anything like that, it's usually <laughs> safe to use. They have some really good practices in place, and there's very few diseases that can be transmitted through the wood chips that are that small in size. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're usually not going to be mulching diseased trees and probably distributing that. So if it's just, you know, wood chips like that, it should be safe to use, and um, yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, great. So, John, quickly someone was asking, you're a member of the Montana Organic Association, and uh, are there going to be any MOA field days this summer, and where should they maybe think about looking for those? Yeah, so we should, we're getting kind of the ball rolling. I think we got a meeting Tuesday on farm tours, um, but we should have a few in the, that we have a few tentatively planned um, Maybe Bob Quinn's Institute, and I've heard Daryl Lasilla might have one, and we're looking for some other suggestions as well. Um, but those will be throughout the summer, and um, where we're looking, I think we're going to try and have six um, field days, so you can just check out the website. And then the conference will be in early December, and that's a really good event to network and meet people. And you know, if you're interested in organic, it's a really fun community to come hang out and visit with everybody. And good food. Yeah, and good, good food. food. Yeah. They do. The Montana Organic Association holds the prize for the best food of most <laughs> meetings across the state every year. So, Abby, we're talking about tubers here. We have a few minutes left. What do you have here in front of us? Yeah. So these are um, sunchokes or Jerusalem artichokes. They're in the sunflower family, Helianthus tuberosus. And um, Mac and I um, and Tim were talking about this uh, earlier, but this is a sunflower-like um, plant, so it's a really great pollinator plant, but these tubers are edible, raw and cooked. Um, and one of the unique things is that their main carbohydrate source is inulin, not starch, like potatoes. Um, I haven't tried 
tried them raw, but I've had them cooked in like curries and stuff like that, and they're pretty good. And Max had experience growing them on um, on the horticulture farm, um, but I'm gonna experiment with this this year and and see what happens. So they it's can, a, it's a yeah. perennial sunflower. Yeah, it's a perennial make sunflower. Great big tall flowers, yeah. and then mm -hmm. they go dormant over the winter. And mm -hmm. then this time of year, you could dig one up, and those look like the roots are just starting to grow again. But yeah, you could take that and clean it. Absolutely. And cook it yeah. and eat it. Yeah, absolutely. I heard they give you gas. <laughs> <laughs> no, what doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. But yeah, this is, is going to be my experiment for this year. Yeah, great. So, okay, we have a couple more callers in a few more minutes here. So, Helena Caller knows that people around town have chickens in small areas that are typically fed food scraps. They would like to know if this will cause problems with the soil later on by feeding food scraps. I don't I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah, I don't think so. I think it's all yeah. well digested by the chicken and comes out the other We've side. We've been feeding food scraps to chickens in my yard for many years. Mm -hmm. Yep, I've never had any. We have a pretty good garden. There. Yep. John, do you have any livestock on your operation? Um, we have a few layer hens, but uh, a lot of the animals that we integrate on the cover crops and the acres are leased to, I have rancher neighbors on each side of me, so mm -hmm. kind of just leased to them and then they can kind of deal with all the cattle and we kind of have a time we like to put them in and so it works out pretty well for everybody. We've had some feed value tests on those cover crops that came back pretty high. I think they were 159 or something and mm -hmm. so they were they were pretty excited about that and their calves were a little fatter at shipping than they'd had been on average so mm. so it works out really well great what kind of arrangement do you have with them um it uh, we is just, it just do trading chores back and forth or is there actually money changing hands um there, it's like a regular lease you know i've heard people say you can get quite a bit more money out of a cover crop lease but we also lease pasture to them so we just kind of keep it Similar right rates. there because it benefits my soil and <laughs> benefits them and if everybody can kind of work together and have that uh you know, that whole relationship working together, then it's really helpful for everybody. Great, thanks. So we have a Billings caller, um, caller from Billings growing grapes. Her day lilies have spread into her grape growing area. What should she do? I mean, I would say dig them up and put them where you want them to be for the yep. day lilies um, if you want to keep them, yeah. Um, now is a really good time to divide your, you know, perennials and things like that. So now is a good time to dig up your daylilies, find a new spot to put them in. Yeah. That's what I would do. Maybe plant some Jerusalem artichokes, yeah. some some choke in there with the daylilies and see what's more competitive. Yeah. Those are yeah. those are tough daylilies because I don't I don't think you'd ever get daylilies going on my grapes. <laughs> no, yeah, no. Um, that's probably much warmer in in Billings. Um, so. Oh, we have another follow-up question from Australia. Are there any edible herbs that are good pollinator plants? Yes, there's a lot of edible herbs that are good pollinator plants. Mint, anything in the mint family is an excellent pollinator plant. Um, basil, you know, things like that. Yeah, lots of herbs um, are really good pollinator plants. Mm. Okay, so cilantro and dill both is yeah. Cilantro. I can't think of one so that fast. isn't yeah. a good pollinator plant. To be honest, I'm trying to think of one and yeah. Yep. Okay, so we have a question, Missoula caller, who has a pasture that's filled with white top, and they want to know how to control it using an organic method. Mm. Oof. That I don't know if I have an answer for. Yep. Um, that's not a weed that I see very often. Um, yeah, so white top is a perennial weed, super dense root rhizome. It'll keep re-germinating out of that underground rhizome over and over. I'm not sure there's a super easy way to control it. Have something be super competitive. Dig out those stands when you can and try to weaken those rhizomes, I think is probably two of the best things that you could do. To you may have to do brute force precision ag and go around and work those those areas with the white top. You say it was in pasture? Yeah, it was in pasture. Would mowing help at all or would that would, spread? So Tim's done some of that research. Yeah, I think but mowing. maybe not with white top specifically. Yeah, not yeah. specifically with white top. Mowing I think would be hard because it just will encourage it to make more and more okay. underground rhizomes over and over and will eventually spread that patch. Is it harmful to livestock? I think it is toxic to livestock. It is a little bit of a toxic um, mustard kind of to livestock. Not super 
acutely toxic, but I think it can be quite toxic if there's long exposure to it. Yeah, I would probably, the organic way would probably be steal in the field or shovel under your foot and dig those rhizomes out, put some soil in there, get some new grass growing on top of it, but it'll be a long, long thing to put together. And that's an expensive proposition and it can be a, a til, uh, erosion risk as well, so that's mm -hmm. not a not an easy. But if it was yep. if it was patch sized, there's yeah. probably things you could do to mitigate the erosion risk, right? So yep. So we're down last 45 seconds of the show. <laughs> we could keep talking about white top for hours and hours, <laughs> but I wanted to take thank John for coming on tonight and being part of the show and um, telling us more about the organic systems of Montana and to the rest of the panelists for joining us tonight. In the last 30 seconds, anybody have anything to add in terms of what to do in our gardening season as it approaches? Too early to start planting? No, it's not too early to start planting, but it's too early to start planting the warm season plants. Arugula and radishes, that's what I've planted. Doesn't matter so when far. you plant your peas as long as you plant them in April. There you go. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us tonight and we'll see you again next week. Thanks. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, MSU Extension, the MSU Ag Experiment Station of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.